I'm pleased to present today's webinar, Offline, Online, How Technology Can Empower Local Refugee Communities. I'm delighted to welcome today's guests, Alan Vernon, Project Lead for UNHCR's New Connectivity for Refugees Initiative. Alan joins us virtually from Washington, D.C. And with him, we welcome Josephine Goub, Chief Executive Officer of the London-based organization TechFugees, joining us today from Brussels. UNHCR's latest report, Connecting Refugees, How Internet and Mobile Connectivity Can Improve Refugee Well-Being and Transform Humanitarian Action, unpacks the critical role that ICT plays in the lives of refugees, specifically the availability, affordability, and usability of information and communications technology in mitigating some of the risks that refugees face across perilous journeys, and how ICT can improve the often precarious conditions under which refugees live upon arrival, whether that's a displacement camp or in the new city and country they call home. Today we invite Alan Vernon to share UNHCR's ambitious and very timely strategy on connectivity for refugees with us. Prior to his current assignment, Alan was Deputy Director of the Division of Information Systems and Telecommunications at UNHCR Headquarters, Geneva, as well as Director for Organizational Development and Management in UNHCR Headquarters. Alan has also served as UNHCR Representative in Malaysia, in Sri Lanka, as well as field assignments in Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, and Thailand. Alan has said, and we quote you, Alan, we see connectivity as key to improving the quality of humanitarian work. It will support innovation and help us work more effectively. On that note, we're truly delighted to have you here today with us. Welcome, Alan. The podium is yours. Thank you, Kim, and it's my, uh, it's my pleasure to be here, and it's my my pleasure to have the opportunity to talk about a subject which is, um, I think we're very passionate about and which we hope can both help improve the quality of the lives of refugees, but also can help us improve the quality of humanitarian work. Um, I'm going to talk about connectivity, and I'm sure all of you are very familiar with it, but just to make sure that we're, we're all on the same page in terms of that. When we're talking about connectivity in the context of this project, we're talking about the state of being connected or interconnected. It's, we're talking about the digital realm, the ability to link and communicate with other electronic devices, be they computer systems, software, and be able to access the internet. We're talking lots about mobile phones, about tablets, laptops, and computers. And the state of connectivity and being connected, of course, is tied fundamentally to the ability to receive and share information, communicate, and then to leverage connectivity to ideally for entertainment purposes, for learning, for education, and for all the good purposes that we, we take for granted today. Um, I'd like to share with you um, the overall format for what I'm going to talk about today. First, I'd like to share in, in the first instance is I think one of the, the four key points that I'd like you to take away from the work that we've done both in the research in the effort that we're making to try to implement a strategy for helping make sure that refugees are reliably connected. I'll share with you a summary of the research findings, but I, I would encourage you, to, as Kim mentioned, to, if, if you're interested to, to look at the report, it's available on our website at, under UNHCR under innovation. You can find it there. And um, it's a, a really a first ever, at least as far as we're aware of, look at the state of, kind of, of to what extent refugees are connected around the world. I'll share with you our strategy for trying to connect refugees, and then we'll, we'll open it up for discussion and, and questions and answers. Um, probably the first um, point that, that we, I'd like to share with you is that in spite of the fact that digital technology is, is expanding dramatically around the world and we have an increasing number of, of people that have access to the Internet around the world, there's still billions of people that are not well connected. Um, for refugees, the fact is that even though um, there are networks that are um, available in many of the locations where they're, they're present, they're not reliably connected. And, and, and this is um, a big challenge for them to be able to, to access the internet, to be able to make use of mobile phones for all the good purposes that we know. 
Um, there is a technical dimension to it in that there are some refugees around the world, some 7% based on the data that we were using as of the end of 2014, um, that are where there is no network where they're located. But what we were surprised to see is that there are at least some kind of networks, in many cases 2G networks, in most of the locations where refugees are. Um, but the challenge is affordability, their ability to afford a phone, a mobile phone, their ability to purchase a SIM card, their ability to purchase data um, in order to be able to take advantage of the phone, to use the phone, to have a subscription. These are major challenges for refugees, usually because of the restrictions that are put, forward, put on them in terms of the inability to work. Um, I think we've been very pleased with the interaction that we've had with the private sector, and it's quite, it's quite clear to us that they are um, very, very ready to work with us to help tackle this challenge. Um, the challenge for us is to figure out how to work together with them in a smart and an effective way. Uh, finally, um, if we're able to achieve a greater degree of reliability in the extent to which refugees are connected, there's enormous potential to improve the way we deliver humanitarian services to refugees. If you visit a refugee camp today in the Middle East and in, in Africa, in many ways you'll see humanitarian actors working the same way we were doing 10, 15, 20 years ago. We're still posting basic information for refugees on bulletin boards. We're still using megaphones and posters, and those, those have a role to play. But there's a huge opportunity to make better use of the internet, to make use of mobile technology in order to communicate more effectively with refugee communities and, and to be able to take advantage of digital technology to, to improve how we deliver education, how we monitor services, how we monitor the well-being of refugees, how we communicate with them. The list is really endless in terms of potential. And so that really waits, um, that potential is really waiting for us to find a way to help sure that refugees are more reliably connected. Um, the vision we have is, is a pretty straightforward one, and I'll just share this with you before I get into the research. Um, you know, what UNHCR aims to do is through creative partnerships and smart investments to ensure that all refugees and the communities that host them, and that's a key point, refugees in the communities that host them, because um, it's important that refugees peacefully coexist with the communities around them and that they can have positive and viable relationships with each other. Um, and so we need to look, at, in particularly in, in the developing world, where if we're focusing on refugees, we also need to focus on the communities that host them. And that, um, as Kim mentioned in her introduction, our framework is that they have access to, that networks are available, that they're affordable, and most importantly, they can make use of them in order to take advantage of these technologies for their own well-being, but also protection, communications, and all the different sectoral areas that we do our work in, from education, health, self-reliance, community power, and also for durable solutions. We believe a well-informed and connected refugee population is, is a population of people that are be they're going to be more open to solutions, they're going to be ready to go home when conditions are right, and so there's big opportunities through connectivity to improve the quality of humanitarian work. Um, the research that we did um, took place over the space of six or seven months in 2015, in the beginning of this year, um, our aim was to undertake as reliable and representative a uh, bit of research as possible. So we used a variety of methods, which include surveys. We purchased data on, on phone, mobile phone coverage around the world. Um, we visited a number of four countries on assessment missions. We asked our colleagues in the field to undertake focus groups in 10 countries. And we've tried to put together as representative a picture as possible of what the situation is on the ground in terms of refugees' access to the internet, within to which they are using mobile phones, and to find out how they're using them. Um, the research yielded some pretty interesting results for us, as I mentioned earlier. We thought the situation was worse than it was in terms of refugees living in areas where there isn't any coverage, but the data as of the end of 2014, based on all locations where refugees are, we were able to put that data set together. Only about 7% of the world's refugees at that time were in areas without any coverage at all. Um, and that's, that's important, which means that if networks are present, even if they're 2G networks, there's an opportunity to improve access without having to worry about enormous investment to, to bring connectivity in areas where refugees are clearly outside of the network coverage. There are some of those areas, and those are important, but at the same time, it's very much 
looks like to be a situation of improving the quality of the networks that do exist, and, and most importantly, to make them more affordable. Um, there's a big difference between urban and rural refugees, and um, the extent to which 3G, which enables um, broadband access to the internet, um, is a gap in many rural areas, and that's where you see this percentage of 50% of refugees live in areas without 3G broadband. Um, that's probably better now because that is improving steadily around the world, but at the time of the data that we were analyzing based on this end of 2014 data set, um, that's what we saw. Um, clearly, the poverty that refugees experience is an important consideration, and our data suggests that refugees are physically than the general population to have an internet-enabled phone. So they may have feature phones, but in order to be able to access the internet um, in, a, in a better way, um, you really do need an internet-enabled phone. And a key factor in that is the cost of, of internet-enabled phones. So th those costs are coming down, but they're still, in many cases, too expensive for refugees. Um, we also have, as a result of the poverty that refugees experience in many locations, many refugees, 29% is shown here, have no phone at all. So that's, that's a challenge for us. The, the, what the data suggests to us, as I mentioned in the key takeaways, is that while network challenges are real and significant in some locations, it's really affordability that's the critical, the critical issue in order to make access so that we can take advantage of the connectivity that refugees have. Um, in terms of the, the more specific findings that we found, um, refugees are not so different than the, than the world generally in terms of the extent to which they have access to the Internet. So the global challenge of getting the remaining 3 to 4 billion people who are not reliably connected to the Internet, that also affects refugees as well. Um, we notice as well that there is a big difference, as I mentioned before, in terms of refugee um, phone ownership where refugees, because of their poverty, are less likely to have phones than the population generally. Um, and you can see the specific uh, data. And there's more descriptive information in the report that's available. Um, in terms of network coverage, there's a big split between urban and rural populations, and that makes sense. Um, but that's important because more than half of the world's refugees are in cities. And so what that means is, is that for urban refugees, the issue of, a, of a network being available is not the challenge. The issue there is affordability. And there, what we've seen is that there's a number of strategies that can help to, to make um, access to the internet more affordable, but they're not so much being pursued right now. And, and so we'll get into that a little bit in the strategy later on, but just to highlight that there are still major challenges for urban refugees. For rural refugees, um, coverage of the type of network is an issue. We still have many locations where refugee camps are, where the coverage is, is, is 2G, which is basic, which means you, can, you have voice, you have text, but you can't really use it to access the internet. Um, and so a challenge for us is to, when refugees are present in these areas, is to see the extent to which we can encourage mobile network operators and the government to give some priority to refugee locations so that the benefits of the internet and mobile technology can be, can be had by refugees in the communities that host them. This difference in phone um, ownership comes through as well in the data where we see that um, urban refugees are much more likely to have an internet-enabled phone, whereas for rural refugees, um, it's much less. And part of that, if there is a network available, is it doesn't make much sense to have an internet-enabled phone if you're not able to reach the internet because the network isn't good enough. So improving the network, as we've seen in some of uh, the countries where we've been active, is if you have a better network, the quality of phones that refugees will purchase for themselves will improve immediately in order to take advantage of that. Um, connectivity, when we talk to all the refugees, and it's, it's completely unsurprising, really, is absolutely critical for refugees in terms of staying in touch with their families. Refugees, of course, have been compelled to, to leave their homes, and in many cases, family members have been left behind, certainly friends have been left behind, um, communities remain, they're, they're absolutely interested in what's going on in their home communities, they want to stay in touch with that. And so having a phone is, is, is really critical to their well-being, um, and they, they are very upset when networks are down or if they lose access for any reason. This is, is really an important consideration for them. Um, they take advantage of social media extensively. Facebook is very popular, in fact, for many refugees. 
who are not so familiar with the internet, if you ask them, do you know what the internet is, they may say no, but if you ask them what's well, Facebook, they know about that because that's the, that's the app, that's the platform that they're most familiar with. But in locations where there is decent uh, network availability, they take advantage of WhatsApp and Skype and Viber, the same, the same set of tools that we take advantage of with uh, uh, internet telephony in order to communicate, they do as well. I think there's an important finding that we had in relation to the purposes they have, what are they doing with the phone, the connectivity that they have. It's quite clear that the most important element for them is to stay in touch with family and friends. Um, there's some utilization of mobile money, but in, as a tool for communicating with the humanitarian community, as a tool for education, as a tool for um, information about health services or self-help in terms of helping refugees better organize themselves in order to, to provide self-help for their members, there's still many, many areas in which um, there's lots of opportunity to improve the quality of the service that are being provided and to be able to use connectivity as a tool for empowerment. It's extensively used today for being able to stay in touch with families, but there's much, much more that we can do. And I think that's the opportunity that having a reliably connected population offers. Um, in discussions with um, refugees, UNHCR staff, and NGO partners, there's a strong consensus um, of the importance around um, connectivity is critical for protection, for assistance, for solutions for refugees. There's some examples there. Um, refugees recognize that they can get, they can educate themselves more effectively. Something like first aid could be shared more um, easily. They love to take advantage of um, online learning. One of the real detrimental aspects of being in a refugee camp is the sheer boredom with the lack of opportunity for meaningful activity that is present in many refugee settings, particularly in camps. And so the opportunity to, to take advantage of online learning as that's exploded on the internet is is a huge potential opportunity. There's constraints to that, of course, with language and the ability to, to use the internet and the extent to which connectivity is available and costs, but it still represents a very big opportunity if we can find a way to seize it. Um, from a security point of view, the urban refugees that we talk to see a mobile phone as critical to their well-being. It's, it's a security device to enable them to be able to, uh, to contact their family and friends if they get into trouble. It's the key means that they have for staying in touch with UNHCR and service providers. So for urban refugees, it is really considered by them to be an absolute necessity. Um, and I think that um, we see lots of potential additional protection um, uses that we could take advantage of in terms of enabling um, the use of hotlines and the ability of, of us to be able to, to reach out to, to more vulnerable populations more easily. When refugees are spread across a large urban area, the challenge of staying in touch with them is very real for you and ATR and for all partners that are trying to help them. And so having refugees reliably connected is, is hugely important. One of the challenges that we see, for example, in that is that for many refugees in urban settings, um, because it's difficult to afford um, data or to be able to get a, a card to stay connected, on the phone, many of them use their phone as an emergency communications device so they don't keep it on, which makes it hard to stay in touch with them. It's often the case as well is that um, the newcomer package of data and subscription is the cheapest one, and so refugees, rather than keep the same number and have to pay more, are often inclined to get a new number so that they can um, uh, save some money in terms of the cost for data in order to be able to maintain their subscription. So these are constraints that we need to work on in order to be able to help make sure that refugees are, are reliably connected. Um, so in, that's a, a real summary, I think, of um, the, the research data that, that we've pulled together. As I say, the key takeaways are is that the situation is not as dire as we thought in terms of the availability of networks. There are some refugees that are in unconnected areas, but generally speaking, they're only in a handful of countries. Um, networks are present, but that doesn't mean refugees are well connected. Um, some of that has to do with affordability. Some of it has to do with simply that um, the networks, in spite of the fact that they're nearby, haven't been connected to the camps. So there are still technical issues to address, but it's not the biggest issue. The biggest issue is affordability. And 
finding strategies to help refugee communities have access to the Internet, either on a community basis or through other means, so that they can, can reap the benefits that it has to offer. Our strategy is built around a framework of availability, affordability, and usability. And this, this, uh, these, it's a logical framework. I think you know if, if networks are not available and not of appropriate quality, we have to work on that. Once we have networks, then the challenge is how do we make it more affordable? Um, to what extent can we bring down the cost of devices? To what extent can we get breaks and somewhat reduce subsidies for for refugees that are still um, don't put them at a, a, a dramatic advantage over local populations because that will create difficulty. But there's still, we believe, space to help bring down the cost of access to the internet and and mobile phone services. Um, and then the big area, of course, is refugees need to be able to use the phone. We know from experience around the world, even if uh, the internet is well available and networks are of high quality, you still have adoption problems with populations because people don't trust the internet, because they're not familiar with the utilization of, commuter, of computers. And so we have challenges around that, certainly, in the refugee population. There's also major issues that, in terms of digital literacy, in terms of safety and security. I think all of us face challenges with that, but it's particularly acute for refugees who are less familiar with the internet, so there's work to be done there. Um, but we also see having a reliably connected refugee population where um, the internet is available and affordable then provides a powerful platform to enable us to improve the quality of humanitarian services in, in every area in which we work. Every area of humanitarian work would benefit from a better ability to share information, a better ability to communicate, a better ability to monitor and follow what's happening. And so that that all those benefits are really available to us with today's technology if we can get to a point where refugees are reliably connected. Um, Around those, the framework of those three areas, availability, affordability, and usability, we believe it's critical that we partner with the private sector. Um, UNHCR and NGOs do not have the technical capacity to be able to build networks or to extend networks or even to improve their quality. We need to work with mobile network operators, with regulators, with governments to encourage um, the extension of, of infrastructure and um, services into refugee-impacted areas for local community and for the refugees themselves. Um, this is an area where not a lot of our research has suggested that this has not been an area of focus for the normal kind of advocacy and lobbying that we do. Typically, we're not very familiar with the, um, the telecommunications mystery. We don't uh, ministry. We don't know who the regulators are. We may not have tried to cultivate relationships with the telecoms providers entry. And in doing so, there's a big opportunity to, to make a difference in um, the extent to which networks are available. There will be times when we need to spend money to improve the quality of infrastructure. And I think there's also a big opportunity, as we'll talk about later, in terms of how to address affordability, um, to make um, free and low cost Wi-Fi available in refugee impacted locations in camps to make um, the availability of Wi-Fi much more present in waiting areas to make sure that community infrastructure is wired so that free or low-cost uh, Wi-Fi services are available, that um, we um, provide charging stations so that they can charge their phones. This is a big problem in, in many camps where um, the absence of reliable power, or in some cases the absence of uh, electric grids, means that the charging of a phone is a major problem for many people. So these are areas that we can work on this. There's also the potential to take good use of, of new and innovative technologies that are being tested in rural locations. and. Um, locations around the world where the internet is not readily available and refugee areas are also potential targets for that. And I think one of the things that happens is it makes them very potentially very attractive because oftentimes the universal service strategies of, of countries to extend the internet to communities that do not have um, quality networks or, or networks are missing entirely is that they may not have, our experience has been is that these plans don't typically take um, it, into account the presence of refugees. And so the presence of 50,000 or 100,000 refugees in an area really does change the dynamic from a business point of view to a, a telecom operator in terms of extending services. They see there's a much larger population. In fact, a city 
present in an area that looked like it was not so heavily populated and, and maybe a more difficult um, area because of the lack of this opportunity to extend networks. So that's a, an opportunity that we see that can make a difference. But there will be times when we need to spend money to um, extend infrastructure. On affordability, um, there is some space, we believe, to help bring the cost down. And certainly the cost of the Internet generally is a barrier for many populations. In, in many developing countries, and it's also the case for refugees. We see that for vulnerable populations in camps, there's going to be a need for subsidies because what we have right now is a situation in, in many locations where the refugees that, that are able to receive foreign remittances are a little bit better off or able to work better to those that are vulnerable. So just things to address vulnerability in other areas of our program, we need refugees to support vulnerable refugees to make sure that they're also connected. Um, certainly the ability to expand community internet access um, through internet cafes, through making sure, as I mentioned earlier, that waiting areas are wired, they put up Wi-Fi hotspots in neighborhoods. All of these are strategies that can help um, ensure access and bring down the cost of affordability. Finally, the ability piece, and um, what we're trying to do is, I think, in the areas of digital literacy, there's big work to be done. It's not very um, extensive. You won't find it in very many programs today where there's efforts at digital literacy in spite of the fact that refugees are connected. But there are very real issues around um, privacy and security of data for refugees. There's adoption challenges um, for refugees that are not familiar. There's language issues for refugees who don't speak English or the languages of the Internet. So there, there's work to be done to improve um, the ability of refugees and to have access. Certainly that a part of that strategy needs to be direct training, and making resources available. But our hope is, is that by, by working on those issues and also by really creating um, a, the availab having reliably connected refugee populations will then provide the basis for humanitarian service providers, UNHCR, and NGOs to be able to take advantage of the fact that refugees are connected to then deliver digital solutions that will improve the quality of their lives, whether that be specific applications for refugees, whether that be um, dedicated websites, there's, there, whether it's online learning, um, health monitoring programs. The list is really unlimited in terms of what we might potentially do, but for us to get there, it's clear that refugees have to be connected first. If they can't reach the internet, it won't matter how good the website is or the app is. We need to make sure that they're able to access that. And there's also a huge potential for refugees themselves to take advantage of digital technology to help themselves, to help them organize, to help them share information, to help them stay in touch with their communities. Big opportunities there. And I can go on and on with this, but just to say that this is the, the way we're trying to tackle the issue. Um, it's still early days for us. We're a comparatively new program, and the, the, the fir more you know, we spent six months in 2015, and the first month of 2016 trying to pull together the research, and now we're trying to move forward on how we can try to build the partnerships with the private sector to help extend these networks. Um, our approach is very much, as I mentioned, about partnership. We see refugees in the communities at the center of this. It's quite clear that we need to have strong partnerships, as we do in every other area of humanitarian work in this area as well. Host governments, donor governments have important roles to play. With, and particularly with host governments, we need to reach out to a new set of actors that we don't typically communicate with. As I mentioned earlier, telecommunications ministries in those parts of government that are focused on information technology. We need to reach out to regulators, a group that we typically don't um, have dialogue with. Um, the other big new area, I think, for this is the private sector, where for many, many years we've tried to been partner with the private sector, but a lot of that effort has been to cultivate the private sector as a donor. In this area of connectivity, we really see the engagement with the private sector as an opportunity to build strong and robust partnerships. We need the expertise of the private sector to help us both make sure that refugees are connected and then to be able to leverage digital technology to improve the quality of the way we do our work. So it's, it's a great opportunity, I think, for a new set of partnerships um, and the challenge is to figure out how to make those work in a time of, uh, you know, the largest uh, migration crisis, refugee crisis that we've had since World War II and at a time in which resources for humanitarian work are increasingly constrained. 
Um, just in terms of what we've done on the ground, just three quick examples. Um, Greece is a good example. Um, Greece, of course, was, was hugely impacted with the, the dramatic increase in the number of, of refugees coming across the Mediterranean arriving early, earlier this year. Um, and it also was an example of the situation that brought great awareness around the world of the importance of mobile technology for refugees, where you, for, for refugees to people who are not so familiar with that. Um, as refugees were arriving in Greece, they were very keen to, to find a place to charge their phone, to get Wi-Fi access. Um, obviously, that first part of the crisis was very much tied to onward movement, but we now face a situation in Greece where the 60,000 or so refugees that are there are likely to be in Greece for some time. But what we have been able to do through a strong partnership with NetHope in particular, but other NGO partners, to ensure that Wi-Fi is available in most of the camps um, so that at least they can take advantage of that as a strategy both to have access to the Internet but also to bring down the costs because at this stage the refugees that are in Greece are not able to work and so the money that they had when they arrived has quickly diminished, and so having access to Wi-Fi is really critical to their well-being um, in many, many ways, and we're now looking at strategies for how we can expand those services and and move beyond just simply access to Wi-Fi, but how can we then take advantage of, of Wi-Fi for service delivery? But that's, I think, a very good example of a response in an emergency situation. Um, we don't have anything quite like that with such extensive coverage of Wi-Fi services in, in other emergencies that have emerged. Um, following that, I think Tanzania is a very interesting example because there we've pursued um, the strategy of really trying to engage with the mobile network operators to convince them that there's an opportunity. When we looked at Tanzania a year and a half ago, um, refugees were connected, but the qualities of, of the network was very weak. Um, parts of the camp. Nyaragusa in particular is a very large camp, and only portions of the camp had any kind of network coverage. It was 2G. We reached out to the local telecoms companies, and today in Tanzania, whereas before there were no towers in the area and it was very remote um, signals and difficult to reach, um, today there are now three towers, Vodacom and two other companies have put up towers there, and we're in discussion with them to expand um, services, including Wi-Fi services and others. This is with the commercial side of these companies. This is not um, corporate social responsibility, but rather this was on the basis of their seeing uh, market opportunities, business opportunities through the ability for the fact that refugees um, are paying customers and purchasing data that they have phones. And so what we're hoping to do is to, to take that to the next level in terms of making more extensive use of digital technology in the programs. We've, we're putting up charging stations with our partners. Um, community centers are now going to be wired for Wi-Fi. Um, we're hoping to expand uh, the availability of Wi-Fi in the schools and the camps um, in Tanzania. So, and this is really the model that we hope to take forward in other areas where there's a strong partnership between the telecoms, mobile network operators, and the NGOs and UNHCR and the refugees and the government to, to improve the situation and help ensure refugees are better connected. Um, finally, the third example I wanted to share with you is in Jordan, where um, there, again, we're working with telecom providers and also with Facebook to extend services, and Microsoft to extend ser NetHope as well, to extend um, digital services to refugees. Um, we have something very innovative thanks to the support of Microsoft, NetHope, and we're providing refugees that are being resettled with Skype vouchers to help them get in touch with uh, family and friends and the, the NGOs that will be supporting them in the countries that they're going to be resettled to. We've also recently, with Facebook and with Zane, uh, one of the mobile network operators that's present in the region and has a strong presence in Jordan, uh, we've wired four community centers so that as refugees visit the community centers for other services, they also have the opportunity to take advantage of Wi-Fi. And these are the kinds of things that we would like to, to expand and, and take to scale as we move forward. Um, if you'd like to know more about the program and the research, uh, this link will, will get you there. It's under the innovation if you go to the UNHCR website. And so with that, uh, I'd like to, to conclude you know, the prepared remarks and the presentation I'd like to share, and maybe we can, can open up for discussion. Thank you very much. 
Well, thank you very much, Alan, for, for sharing that excellent overview of, of UNHCR's vision uh, and strategy and, and showing us all uh, where opportunities exist to, to better understand what connectivity means for refugees. Helping us uh, also understand, you know, that what it means to move, as you say, from from megaphones to mobile technology to digital technology. Um, uh, the report acknowledges not helping us understand really the the breadth of refugees' digital needs, but also that uh, the significant opportunities that exist for private sector, civil society, and uh, refugee serving organizations uh, in in urban in in the urban environments that so many of them live in, um, and governments, of course, to better connect, manage, and move refugees uh, into more stable circumstances. Uh, an excellent survey, a, a wonderful um, segue now, more than ever uh, before. We need to work together uh, and. Uh, I'd like to introduce and now and now turn the conversation over to Josephine Goob, who is Chief uh, Executive Officer at TechFugees. Um, TechFugees is listed as one of the 30 under, uh, actually, no, sorry, not TechFugees, but Josephine Goob herself is listed as one of the 30 under 30 social entrepreneurs of 2016 by Forbes. Congratulations, Josephine. Um, Josephine calls herself a hacktivist for migrants and refugees in Europe. As CEO at TechFugees, a social enterprise coordinating the international tech community's response to the needs of refugees, Josephine helps structure and coordinate the organization's activities in 25 countries and focus its work on tech that can make the most impact for refugees and the NGOs that support them. Previously, Josephine was tech evangelist for the web-based recruitment platform YBorder, which supports the mobility of software engineers within the borders of Europe. On that note, please uh, help me in, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Josephine Goop to our uh, webinar today. Over to you, Josephine. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Yeah, um, just maybe a few words about TechFugees for people that are on this uh, webinar and would wonder what TechFugees is. So as you said, um, TechFugees is a nonprofit. It's based out of London. We are basically mobilizing the tech industry and community to build tech solutions to the needs of refugees. Um, that means we organize advocacy events like conferences and hackathons where technology is going to be prototyped and knowledge is going to be shared of uh, technology that work on the ground projects and really, uh, and really shared across the community of techies online and offline. Um, in, so TechFuge is super young. We're one year old. We are present in 25 countries around the world through a network of volunteers. And we work on five areas, connectivity, health, education, identity, and social inclusion. We have 15 minutes where um, I'll ask you questions, Alan, um, and thank you so much for your presentation. And then we'll go into Q&A, and, and I think we have great questions, so I just uh, will ask you, Alan, to, to try to be concise when responding to questions. And I know there's so much that could be said, so um, <laughs> it's okay if you, if you want to go deeper. But my first question um, related to your presentation you made, and your report really highlights that we have various barriers to connectivity, from access to affordability. Um, and the good news you said, you said is that the problem is rarely the technology. Uh, in 93% of cases, the infrastructure is in place. And as you said, it's affordability. But your report, um, and you touched on it about a bit in your presentation, your report doesn't address the, the big political challenge. I'm thinking of European cities, for example, where there's so many urban refugees, um, and there's an hostility from host communities that are claiming that refugees are getting an unfair advantage. They are being better treated than other disadvantaged groups. Um, and I hear also a fear that providing internet could contribute to radicalization or connect refugees with smugglers. I've, I've heard this in Austria, I've heard this in Calais, I've heard this in Oslo. Um, so how can we address these political barriers to connectivity? How do you do to address those? That's a great question. I think, I think it's a big challenge. I mean, maybe just a, 
let me just start first just on the, the technology um, piece just because I, I don't want to leave the impression that there aren't challenges around the, the technical aspect of the availability of networks. There are challenges to that. But I think they're, they're challenges that are, are surmountable because we can, we, can, we can address the fact that um, if you have a 2G network, generally speaking, there's interest in expanding the network to making it 3G and to improve the quality of the service or to extending it. And I think that, that they think well, that will work, and that's a good news. So there, there are still some elements in terms of that. But the, but the real question you're asking here is, is a very real and worrying concern. Certainly the refugee crisis in Europe with the dramatic numbers that have arrived have, have challenged the, the systems um, for supporting and receiving refugees. The asylum process is a legal process, and it takes time to work through that, and with dramatic numbers beyond what was expected at a time of economic uncertainty um, is really a, a, a very difficult set of um, combined factors to try to address. I think that the, the fear around refugee access to the Internet is, is very much caught up in the, the concerns with um, the presence of so many refugees and um, the fact that it would, the, the European crisis was just so dramatic with people arriving by boats and trying to move on in particular toward Germany or toward Scandinavia. And this, of course, um, has many political dimensions and, and, and lots, of, lots of difficulties. Everyone knows that. So I think the challenge is how we address it. I think that what we need to do and this is what we're trying to do in UNHCR, is to incorporate the issues into, of, of, of connectivity into our broader efforts around um, trying to create uh, tolerance and empathy and support for, for refugees generally. Um, the, anytime there's a perception in a, in a local population that refugees are privileged over the local population, that's a problem. Um, and even if it's not true, if people perceive that, then we have to address that issue. And so there the issue is really around raising public awareness, um, helping people understand, helping them engage, um, specifically around the Internet. Um, I think our, our experience has been quite strong is that a better informed refugee population is the population that's more likely to go home when conditions improve in their countries. Refugees are very reluctant to leave their homes. I mean, the evidence in that in the, is that uh, while there, you know we have a huge displacement, forced displacement crisis around the world of some 65 million people, the number of internally displaced who chose to stay in their country and not leave is far larger than mm -hmm. the number of refugees. So it's yeah. it's not an easy question to address. We need to be sensitive to local populations. I think we need to to not. We have to be understanding and listen clearly to those concerns and try to address them effectively. But it's um, it is it is a concern. I think we would we certainly having access to information is better than cutting people off from information. And so we we want to try mm -hmm. to promote as open an atmosphere as we can. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You 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 just mentioned IDP, and that brings me to actually um, to the second question. You, IDPs sometimes are um, treated so internally displaced, um, are sometimes treated like refugees in their own countries, which is um, they don't yeah they are treated like refugees. And one thing that I've seen is um, that they can't access also to mobile technology and internet, uh, which you know shouldn't happen within your own country. But anyway. You mentioned that, uh, that they can't access mobile technology and internet, but you don't mention in the report the problem of data security and privacy. We know how vulnerable someone can be once their information and identities match with a phone number. Um, so how are you working with mobile providers to ensure that the information they collect does not make refugees more vulnerable? Um, how are you addressing those basic security issues? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think the um, the challenge of, of data security um, and safety is is present for everybody. We have a, all of us have issues with staying safe and secure on the internet and data breaches and how do you manage your password and is sharing your information on a website is that a safe thing to do? Is it not safe? What are they going to do with your data? All of these elements are present just for the general population, but for refugees. These issues add additional risk because of their, their circumstances, because they're outside of their country and they can't turn to their own protection for support. And there are, of course, also the concerns around um, the potential that unauthorized access, whether they be state or non-state actors. There's the risk of surveillance 
um, loss of data, theft, password management. Um, there, there's enormous issues that are that are present in terms of this. I think what we found in our research, which was distressing, frankly, was that there wasn't much focus on this among within UNHCR and also among our, our NGO partners. Refugees were connecting, are connecting when networks are available. They're desperate to connect. So if there's a phone network available, there's internet available, refugees will connect. But this was happening without us being sensitive to it because it wasn't part of our standard way of working. So I think the challenge for us is to integrate this into our work that Connectivity in, in the digital realm are areas that um, need to be the focus of protection in the same way as they, any other area of safety and security for refugees. Something that's specific that we've worked on, I think it's reflected in the report, you're right, it hasn't been expressly um, identified there, but it's the focus on digital literacy that is where we, we tried to bring that in. But an important step that UNHCR took in 2015 was to develop a data protection policy you know, because we need to work out how do we address these issues. And that, that's been done in 2015. We're now promoting that for all new projects in UNHCR. There has to be an assessment of the, the data policy implications. And given that we're um, looking at, across the humanitarian sector, increased use of cash, I mean, one of the main means for delivering cash is going to be mobile money or through accessing bank. Um, records online, um, access to this. And so there is work to be done, for sure, to make sure that we um, incorporate um, these concerns into, into the, to the way we work. In terms of working with the mobile network operators, as I mentioned in my report, we don't have historically have relationships with them, and yet they hold an enormous amount of data about refugees and, and all their mm -hmm. customers in terms of that. And um, typically, a UNHCR team wouldn't, wouldn't know the know your customer rules. We wouldn't be familiar with the legislation and, and the rules in terms of that, and those are areas that we need to make progress on. Um, and so what we'd like to see happen in UNHCR is that we build internal awareness about that. Certainly when you start to, to um, make available Wi-Fi um, in, in a location, say if it's an internet cafe in a community center in um, an urban setting, we need to, to look into the issues of who will have access to be able to monitor that. What are the security protocols in place to ensure that it's not tapped? Um, there, there's many new issues that emerge out of this, and there's ones that we're going to have to learn together on because I think um, it's quite clear that in some ways, in spite of the fact that uh, the digital revolution has been going on for a long time, um, the humanitarian sector is, is far behind in, in looking at these kinds of issues. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think you've got a good point when you say that if you haven't touched upon much the question, but it could come into um, the question of digital literacy that you're working on. Because, um, I mean, from Techies, what we've seen is a lot of refugees um, don't use a smartphone to its full potential. Uh, for example, in the West, we might think that the Internet is Google, and refugees think the Internet is Facebook or WhatsApp. Mm. So um, downloading apps uh, is not something that they would just do as a – they wouldn't use their phone as a productivity tool. They, they, you said it before several times. They use their phone as a communication tool, as to communicate with their families and access to, um, yeah, their loved ones. So can you touch upon very briefly uh, on to what are your digital literacy training or programs that will help refugees get the right information? Because also, again, in the context of – Europe and their moves, there's a lot of misinformation and there's a lot of smugglers trying to give them the wrong information. It's another really good question. I think what we what we saw going into this was that there was a big need for, for a digital literacy program. There are literacy issues for some a small portion of refugees who are not literate. So for a, a non-literate person to be able to, people, they can still use phones, um, but, you know, the internet is is difficult to access if, you, if, you're, if you're not able to read. Um, but no, nevertheless, so that represents one challenge. But that's not the major issue. I think the major issue is no. digital literacy, familiarity with these things, and to mm -hmm. be able to go beyond. Uh, it's there. I think we, um, we're only starting in this area. I think the good news on that is that we've been able to compile. There's a rich body of resources 
on, on the web, on the internet, on digital literacy that we can take inspiration from and make use of. Um, GSMA has, has very good uh, digital literacy training materials that are available, as do many other organizations. Facebook has just put up a, a, web, a new website on this. So I, don't, I think there's a lot of available information that we would like mm -hmm. to put in place. We, are, we have in the three countries that um, I've mentioned the examples with Jordan, with um, Greece, and with Tanzania. We have coordinators on the ground, and they're they're trying to figure out how they can try to integrate digital literacy into the 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 existing education and community community services, community outreach programs that we have. Our communicating with communities initiatives. Um, there's a big opportunity, as we've seen, and we discovered this in our research, that refugees that are more skilled are well positioned to help others who are less skilled. And so there's a great opportunity for refugees themselves yeah. to take on responsibility in terms of this and that's going to be both I think effective as a strategy both because it's they they can easily the communication issues are not there but it's also a great opportunity for us to, to help create some additional employment for people as we move forward so it, it needs to be addressed I would say the there's little to date that we saw in programs where there's models that we can draw from specifically targeting refugees but there's plenty of work that's been done for local populations and on the internet that we can draw from to help to help um, address these issues. But clearly, we need to do so. That's a piece that needs to be built into these into the programs as we go forward. And it should be a part of our standard protection and education work in humanitarian operations. Yeah, yeah, I really like the idea of older refugees or uh, more knowledgeable refugees um, teaching the others. And that's what we what we've seen our uh, events. Refugees. But I'll go on quickly to my last question, and we can go on to move to a Q&A. So in the report, it says, you recognize the strength of partnerships to take this work forward. Um, Techfugees brings together a civic community of tech entrepreneurs, techies, who want to make a difference city by city. In your opinion, what's the biggest contribution that community of technologists can do at a local level to support this work? I think at the local level there's a huge opportunity. Um, and, and the key to it is, is there's no real secret to it. I think it's engagement with the, the refugee communities themselves and with the service providers, whether they be the community organizations, to, to um, just to interact with the refugees and help understand the issues and challenges that they're facing. Many of them can be, can be addressed um, together. In terms of this, I just cite maybe some examples. I was uh, um, our country director, what we call the representative in Malaysia, for six years prior to going to Geneva um, in 2014. And um, there, as part of trying to do outreach to the urban refugee community, we worked with local technology partners in a number of ways. We were able to establish training partnerships with, with service providers there, and, and that was very much on a model of train the trainers, so it was training up refugees so that they could then teach basic digital literacy and basic computer skills to the population, but also the opportunities for learning. We had local communities helping refugee community self-help organizations just organize databases so they could would work with their members. Um, we did work in the case of Malaysia, another example where we worked with a local partner to help um, find internet resources for teachers who were teaching Malaysian primary school curriculum so they could turn to that. I mean, the, the students couldn't manage the English necessary to access those websites, but the teachers had enough English to be able to do so. So I think that the, the, the secret is simply to the engagement and then out of that mm -hmm. to allow allow solutions to emerge. Um, and then on a broader level, as we find local solutions, to make sure that there's opportunities for sharing of, of good practices and, and opportunities so that um, we can see which of those can be brought to scale and leveraged as, as bigger solutions. Um, that's, that's generally true for solving any kind of problem, I think, with refugees and working with them and providing mm -hmm. support just to be with the communities, to interact with them, to see where their issues are, and, and then to, to build out of that. And I think the, there's a huge opportunity to, to link with um, the, the technology communities in cities um, are, are, have lots of potential to do this as part of the work that they're doing, whether it's on a, as part of their corporate social responsibility or outside of work, which, and they also may find commercial opportunities in it. And I think what's been very 
very exciting to see is is the how active the private sector has been in response to the crisis in Europe. Um, we've seen good examples in the U.S. as well uh, of efforts on this. So I think there's it's really let engage and talk and figure out how we can solve the problems together. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, well, thank you. Why don't I jump in here? Thank you both to uh, Alan and Josephine. That was a, a, it's been a brilliant exchange. We want to keep this going. We've got lots of really interesting questions. Uh, people are intrigued by the insights and new ideas that you've offered us. So let's move right away to our Q&A, see how many we can get in over the next 10 uh, or 15 minutes. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, a couple of questions that we've received about the UNHCR research itself. So these are for um, for Alan. Um, Boram at the Women's Refugee Commission is interested in whether there were age and gender dimensions to the work. For example, she said, um, if women or youth have less or better access to the internet and smartphones. So maybe we'll start there. That's a great question. And and there were some, and we if you if you see the report, you'll see that there is um, in, there are some distinctions that we could see from a, a, a gender perspective, and, and in some locations, it was clear that um, access to the phone within families, for example, was, was very male dominant. Dominant, but but not always. It also in it, with poor populations, we also saw that kind of in some locations that the manager of the phone was the was the mother in the family. So there is there are some distinctions in terms of that, but I think we need to do more research to really get it get at it more effectively because I think if we just look at other areas of humanitarian work, there's always a gender dimension that we need to examine and I think we're we're still not as far into this as we would like to be to better understand these issues. Certainly there are in vulnerable populations um, where we already provide specialized services for the more vulnerable. Um, often women and children are in need of special support because they're because we're not we're talking about separated children or we're talking about um, non-intact families. And so there the same thing holds true in terms of support around connectivity. So that, that certainly came through. It's also quite clear that youth are ahead of the rest of the population. Young young adults, older teenagers and young adults are very keen on technology, unsurprisingly, and often are the most skilled users um, and very much want to be connected to the refugee youth. They're just like a youth everywhere. You know, they, they want to follow what's happening in the culture. They want to stay connected. They're, they're interested in music. They're interested in the arts. So that, that clearly is present. And they're, I think, a big resource for helping um, expand uh, digital literacy in in communities of refugees as we go forward. So yeah, it's an important area for sure, and one that there's there's good work to be done to address. Okay, great. I have another sort of uh, research-based question from Rachel, who works in resettlement in the U.S. She wants to know if you have any data about refugee connectivity that is refugee. Uh, U.S. specific, and uh, so maybe you can answer that question. We can certainly refer her to sources. Uh, we won't actually go into the resources themselves in, in the interest of time. But uh, do you know about any data on refugee connectivity that's U.S. specific? Unfortunately, no. I mean, we we focus, not surprisingly, the the research on the developing world to a large extent. Um, in part because that's where we assumed going in that the, the challenges would be greatest. But just in conversation with some of the, this is anecdotal, but just in conversation with some of the the, the private voluntary agencies that are involved here, it was interesting to, to chat with them that even newcoming refugees struggle with the affordability of, of, of connectivity in the U.S. So it's, it's um, I don't have any really, but I think that the 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 challenges around the cost are ones that um, are are true for refugees in the U.S. and elsewhere in the developed world. That these these are present with just you know phones cost a lot of money. So does data. So do plans. So does the internet. So bringing those costs down is an important issue. Important challenge. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to move now. I'm going to bundle a couple of questions that we have really on how, um, how, how community sector organizations can work together to support an agenda like the one you've outlined. I have uh, from Tobias um, at uh, 
uh, Tobias Staff in Berlin asks, what can public sector agencies do to better facilitate the development of an ecosystem for digital service delivery development um, of refugee relevant content? Uh, and I, Paul um, Levy, uh, Levy Paul Emanuel also is interested in how to improve collaboration and coordination between NGOs to push this work forward. Um, so why don't we, we start with you, uh, of course, um, Alan, but I think, uh, Josephine, we'll look for your views on this too. So what can public sector agencies do to facilitate um, sort of an ecosystem for digital service delivery and uh, as well as improve collaboration between agencies? Well, I think, I think the, um, in, many, in, many, in many locations, there's a lack of awareness around the challenges that refugees face. And so um, we need to do a better job of bringing this uh, a marginalized population, such as refugees in many instances. But there are other marginalized populations, too, that um, there's a need to, to look for more specific digital services for a, a population like refugees. That's, I think that's a big step. Um, usually we need to, as over time, we differentiate our services in order to respond to the diversity within populations. And I think that holds true for, for refugees as well. Um, just generally in the humanitarian sector, I mean, we've made a lot of progress in the way in which NGOs, the UN, and, and the range of actors, intergovernmental organizations are involved in responding to refugees. But still, um, coordination and cooperation remain important challenges. I think we're, we're very excited, for example, about the partnership that we have with NetHope, which is a consortium of NGOs. And um, that's, I think, a great way for us to try to, to improve the way we work together. But it's a, it's, a, it's a recurring phenomenon across many areas of humanitarian work. And I think the finding out how we can um, work in the right relationship with each other, cooperate more effectively, is one that we need to put on the table and discuss together to look for, for appropriate solutions. And, and, and yeah, uh, I, Josephine, yeah, can go I, ahead. Yeah, can I, add, I think it was a brilliant point to make that most people don't know the exact real challenges of refugees. Um, there's what's being written and, and said on the internet, and then there's the reality. And it's really not difficult to see what are the challenges and basic challenges that refugees are facing if you meet them and work with them. Um, and I'm saying this because um, this is one thing that I think differentiates refugees to a lot of, of the humanitarian sector. Is we look at refugees as, um, as individuals with needs. Uh, more than anything else. So we look at them as user of technology. So we have a user um, experience design approach centered on just this. And then we also have, um, we also have the approach of de delivering on their needs um, instead of seeing them as beneficiaries. So yeah, it just really changes the perspective when you look at them as people with needs. Um, and that's the problem solving attitude of technologies that um, really help in that case, I think, to deliver on those needs. And how, and how Josephine, in your experience with tech refugees, uh, you know, are, you, are you mobilizing community action to, um, to identify solutions uh, to some of these issues? Maybe you can speak on how you bring, uh, that was one of the questions, how we, how, how, how can non what tips have you got for nonprofit and community sector organizations um, to work together on, on these issues? So we, we organize hackathons. Hackathons are um, maybe trendy and buzzy words. It's fine. At least we do them maybe a different way. So we, by hackathons, it means that we create an event of, uh, 42, 52 hours over a weekend, where we're going to have NGOs, technologists, and refugees in that same space discussing together how do we create solutions to refugees' issues. And so we have, on the first day or first night, we have refugees talking about their story and who they are and what are, have been their challenges and also what is their use of technology. Then we have NGOs also talking about the way they operate and the stress at the moment or what they're challenged by. And then we spend the next two days with technologists 
and refugees um, co-creating solutions that could be helpful in those situations for the individual, for the refugee, and for the NGOs. Um, and it's really, it's really bringing people, connecting people together, and having them in the same room. I don't, I don't see this often. To see refugees with technologies with NGOs in one room, um, and I think it's more and more needed. When I, I mean, I've been to many events where we talk about refugees, but there's no refugee in the room, or many uh, panel discussion where there's absolutely no refugees on the panel. Uh, or if they're refugees, they're here not to be empowered and asking the question as a moderator, uh, which would be interesting as a format, but more about tell us your story. And um, so I think Tech, Tech Fugees is doing a great job at having refugees pitch their story as human beings, as individuals with some challenges. Um, and, and often we say, or I say, that uh, we don't really talk about refugees. We talk about people with refugee status, because at the bottom of of, of things is those human beings have been given a title, and that is the real challenge for them in their life. If they're put in limbo, waiting to be able to work, that's because they don't have the refugee status. If the kids uh, can't sleep at night and have nightmares, it's because they're in limbo and they don't know if they're going to be deported back uh, to Afghanistan. So. It's, uh, there's a whole political dimension that we cannot um, silence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, I, I have a quick uh, a question here from uh, Christa Muller-Neumann, who's uh, with Lackey in Germany, uh, and who's wondering uh, whether you'd like to comment on what tech UGs are doing in Germany, given that that country, um, a shining sort of beacon for, for the rest of the world, um, it took in a million refugees um, into their cities and, and towns last year. Um, do you want to give us an example yeah. of some of the work yeah. you're doing in Germany? Yeah. That. I've lost our activity again. Hello. 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 Are you, yeah. Do you want to give us yeah. an example in, from Germany then? So uh, we, in Germany last year, we uh, partnered with Ready School um, and Hackerspace to create a hackathon in June, where uh, maybe some of the people that live in Germany have heard of. We, the winners of that hackathon were um, were a group of Syrian students at Ready School that created an application uh, called Bureau Crazy. That was an application to apply for the refugee status in Germany, translated in Arabic and making it easy uh, for any person, any refugee coming speaking Arabic to apply for the refugee status. Um, it was created by the refugees themselves in collaboration with techies that were at the event. And that's, for example, uh, one thing we did in that's, Germany. Oh, isn't that brilliant? Well, that's uh, wonderful. I have a couple of questions about um, specific uh, sorts of apps, and one of them, of course, on translation. Um, I have a question here from Matt, who's with the Multicultural Association of Fredericton here in Canada, and he's very interested in some of the translation software that's being developed and, and what role it plays. So maybe we can turn that to you, um, Alan, and then back to you, uh, Josephine, translation software. Yeah, it's, uh, I think we see the, the quality of the translation software getting better. And better. And that's the good news. I think the, the, the less good news, maybe the, the bad news is, I don't see it, the humanitarian community yet making much use of this. Um, so we're still, in many, many instances, relying in, in the way we deliver our work um, just on interpreters. And that's fine, but uh, you never have enough interpreters. And um, it's, it's not the most efficient, effective way. And certainly, there's a big opportunity in this I think because of the quality that the the, the interpretation, the translation softwares have just gotten so much better that there's a, there's a big opportunity here. It hasn't been used very much, although there's some, but it's not it's not as much as you don't find it everywhere you go. You find, you see certain examples of it, but it's I think there's it's another area of missed opportunity because of. Um, a lack of familiarity with how to do it, and I think the absence of uh, reliable connectivity. Hmm. And Josephine? Um, yeah, I mean, this is a missed opportunity, really, because 
the number uh, of people in our community, TechFuture's community, having created softwares and applications for a online immediate translation in Urdu, Pashtun, Farsi uh, is there, is out there uh, in Greece. And so um, I'd be happy to introduce them to you as soon as possible. So that can happen. I mean, I've seen the technologist in front of me. Uh, we were with a doctor and uh, um, the doctor would speak in German and then the, 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 the translator online on the computer would uh, would uh, translate automatically in Arabic, and the, the, the face of the woman, of that um, Syrian woman, would lighten up. It was brilliant. Um, and the same thing happened in uh, Greece, where um, one of the uh, one of our community member has created for now five years the community of translator online for conferences, tech conferences, and now he's been able to shift his project to help the refugees that come at shore and try to get information on where they are, where they can access uh, services and goods, as well as information about their status. So there is a lot out there that need to be connected together. OK, great. Now I have a, uh, I have a question from uh, Saskia, who's specifically intrigued by the use of WeChat and QQ in your sample, Alan. Where did refugees use these platforms, and where were the refugees from? I don't have a specific answer to that just readily available with me, but I think I think what we saw was um, they were these were the replies to the survey that we made in in terms of that, and I'd have to go back and pull the the specific data locations in terms of that. What I think was was interesting to us was though is that um, the the refugees, many of the refugees are many of the populations that we're concerned about are 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 internet savvy, and they they are they identify online new applications that they can take advantage of for for you know for communicating over the internet and and that's a good sign for us in terms of that I don't I'd have to go back to the data to pull out exactly where these particular ones are used, so I don't have that readily available. Sorry about that. No, we can come back to you on that one. Um, but uh, interesting questions. I've got another question from Ornella and Tangana from the Refugee Youth Program in Canada, also interested in um, the the uh, your the the in the fact that your report citing that refugees have fairly high usage of social media platforms, she's she's interested in um, some of the security uh, issues raised um, by that issue that's come up in a couple from a couple of callers also from Martina Tazioli, um, who's concerned about uh, whether more connectivity doesn't mean more traceability. So the question is, how are confidentiality and privacy concerns being mitigated? Um, in how, uh, what, are, what sort of recommendations are being made uh, about how to mitigate uh, those issues? Alan? As I say, I think we, it is an important issue and concern. I mean, I think that you have, you have a couple angles that, are, that, are, that, need, that we need to look at. In, in the case of uh, a refugee who has access to the Internet, or, and is doing so privately as a private person in terms of that, our challenge is to, is to particularly in refugee settings, is to make sure that um, we carry out our duty of care to make sure that there's information made available on safe and secure use of the Internet, that people um, are able to, to use the Internet as safely as secure as we can help them do that. And that, that's, that's clearly a gap in our program in spite of the fact that you have refugees doing that as not through a program where we're prone to them, simply they had the resources to buy a phone to get to the Internet to, or to a small computer in order to be able to do so. And so the question is, are they doing so in an informed way or are they taking unnecessary risks? And there we have, have work to be done. We also see that there's, because of the way we're, we're working, whether it be cash transfers, that uh, a data protection impact assessment, particularly if there's any elements of sharing data. So for example, if we're going to, to work with a bank um, in, to enable um, cash transfers, then we need to make sure that the bank has appropriate policies in place to ensure that um, the data is safe and secure and that they use it in a responsible manner and they don't share um, untowardly to, to others. There, there are lots of steps that we, that we need to take in terms of that. 
um, in order to make sure that um, we uh, allow refugees to make informed choices about the sharing of their data. Um, and this, this requires, um, in some cases, we need to enter into data transfer agreements. Um, we need to, we will, you know, our data policy is now something that we share as part of our partnership agreements. So, so we're moving in that way. But I think the broader challenge is just around the, the Internet is available for people if they can afford to reach it. And the question is, what responsibilities do we have to help make sure that they can do so effectively given the duty of care that we have when we're directly engaged in helping and supporting refugees? Yeah, great. And Josephine, I mean, is this is this a subject of some of the work that you that you do at TechFugees? Is this uh, have, you, have you organized any hackathons on these issues? It's a big issue. Yeah, we've organized workshops on this. It's, it's an issue that we address at every of our hackathon um, because. Obviously, we get people from the tech community, and what we've seen in the last year is business model relying on data. So you have to tell straightforward, directly at the first hour of the event, whatever you build, and if you want to make it sustainable, the business model will likely not be relying on data. And, and that message, um, we enforce it every event we do, because we've seen people creating apps for refugees and then having in their terms and conditions that the data will be used and sold to marketers for better services for yeah. the refugees, which sometimes uh, I don't believe that it really enables the service to be better. How do knowing um, my uh, name, last name, uh, date of birth, exact date of birth, and the location will really help me get better services new eyes. Sometimes it's just not really relevant. So what we've uh, highlighted to our community is ask for personal information if you need them, if that really improves the quality of the service you provide. If not, then just don't ask. And then there's also the whole uh, encryption of data. There's also the other part, which is don't put all the data in one sheet. So it's just about mm -hmm. separating. If you have the phone numbers, you don't have the names by, by itself. Um, and as you said, Alan, um, it, you can be as secure as you want on, on your data servers using the latest technology. It's also about the processes. How do in your team, how are you processing that information, entering it, accessing it, and having this culture within your team of security and privacy of data? And that's more of education of people and the way they, they manage the data than uh, a technical issue. At core. Thank, <clears throat> thank just, you. Just, just adding on that, just one small point. I think what we've seen also has been there's a tendency to ask, and I think you alluded to this, Josephine, for data they don't really need. Yeah. So there's totally. there's so there's you know a long questionnaire that it's not necessary when in fact it was only totally. one data element, and this ha this happens a lot. Um, and saying, well, why do you want this data? And when you challenge them, and they, it's it's there isn't a good reason. I just thought it would be interesting to have it, and um, yeah. that's a question. But I think the challenge for us is that to build this in as part of the way we we manage the safety and security for people, because people won't know to ask that necessarily. Um, and refugees may not, and refugees are just us generally, it's the general public may not realize the fact that there's an interest on the part of them to sell data. You know, I you know we get mail all the time from people. How did they get my address? I mean, this happens normally in day-to-day -day reality, but the, this for refugees is, is potentially a very real concern. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I think we have just time for one um, more question, uh, and this one is from uh, Vera Sheridan, uh, who is an academic and former child refugee in Dublin, um, and she asks, Given that many organizations will be creating online programs or offering um, and or offering potentially unsuitable pre-existing or older programs, she wonders uh, how to address the issue of quality and the accreditation of some of these training programs, uh, how that might be addressed. Is that something that UNHCR has thought about um, in terms of its digital training programs, Alan? I think we, we have a little bit, but I would say, it, you know, when you're, when you're looking at an environment where there isn't much, then you're hopeful to try to create the content. And as you move forward, um, the the need is to then, oh my God, we now have a lot of stuff that we see the quality is uneven or some of it is inappropriate. We should have had a way to 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 
vet this or to try to certify it. I think we've not gotten there in terms of it, but it's certainly um, what we're trying to think about is how we can try to, to make sure that we don't find ourselves two or three or four years from now trying to tackle this, that we can try to bring, that we can try to build in the, the safeguards from the beginning. I, we don't have a, a magic solution for this because the, I mean, the ability to build an app and put, or to build a website and put it up on the internet is so easy in comparison to what it was in the past. Um, but in the same way, you know, we have a major issue that's emerged in the last year around fake news on the internet. A lack of quality in an online learning program is also a potential, or, or a program that is conveying inappropriate messages is also a concern that we'll need to figure out a way to address. And we certainly are not organized around that yet, I would say. Lots of work still to do. Well, Josephine, I, you know, this, uh, this question goes straight to the comments you uh, just made on, on the security issue, how important the process is in, in how these uh, challenges are, are approached. Um, uh, it's, 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 it's the core, the process of the core. I mean, we do, we, I mean, in everything we do, it's not about the end. It's about the process. The process will bring you to yeah. the end. We have a user centered design because at, in the process, it must be thought for the user. We have uh, we have refugees that are even speaking first because they are the ones that are going to describe the challenge, um, and we need to have them create the solution with us. Um, the process is the thing that we should care even more than the solution sometimes, I think. Uh, but just to, to add on, Alan, and, and your question, we, at the cities after a year, we've been realizing how much fragmentation there is in the technology, in, in the solutions, tech solutions brought on the market, how there's a sort of ecosystem that has been created since last year in Europe, especially. And, and there's fragmentation, there is also duplication. So we've started building a platform now to bring um, a database of all these technologies and curate them. So we are listing what we see, and we are testing them, and we have a team in Cambridge, uh, especially a team expert in data security and privacy, looking at every project that comes out and sort of validates them or not uh, in terms of is it useful and is it secure, and do we see here a best practice of how to help the refugees with technology. So we're, we're trying to create that. We are trying to help this creation process here. Well, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. It's a wonderful um, note on which to, to end our webinar. Our time really, we've gone over time because we, 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 there was, the questions were so very interesting. I always like at the very end of our session to ask the, uh, our, our speakers um, one last question for both of you, and that's, you know, what is your next um, move? What's your next uh, big idea for each of you? Uh, plans for building on the wonderful work you've shared with us today. Alan? Alan? Sure. I mean, I think, I think the, the, we've seen it with what um, Josephine has shared. There's, there's enormous potential in the, the partnership around, with the private sector, with humanitarian actors. And I think we've, the European crisis has accelerated that partnership in very interesting ways. We don't see that in other parts of the world yet in terms of that. And I think that the strengthening the partnership with technology companies, with the mobile networks, is a huge way to improve the quality of support for refugees, for internally displaced, for disadvantaged populations. So we need to know how to do those partnerships more effectively. I think there there's still very basic questions about how formal we need to be, to what extent do we, are these legal arrangements, are these um, strategic partnerships, uh, it's a great area to be working in right now, but it's one where there's lots of, of new challenges to work through. So, but the great. partnership is clearly key. Good. How about you, Josephine? Next big big idea, big move? <laughs> I'm, I'm excited about what I just told you, which is BaseUG, this uh, platform we're building, which will map the innovation in technology for refugees. I'm excited because um, there's been so much innovation, as I told you, and duplication fragmentation, so this mapping will help navigate that innovation. I think it will help in terms of partnerships also because it, it's going to be a platform where refugees and NGOs can pitch their challenge and technologies come with some solutions, but it will be also a platform where the community exchange on 
best practices on how did you partner with that organization that is an NGO or a political organization or and I think we need dearly that knowledge of uh, what is a good partnership, how does it work, what is a failed partnership, um, what works, what doesn't. We, yeah, I'm really excited about that library we're trying to build and um, we're very much looking forward for next year to fundraise enough for people to get that. There's a need for that ecosystem to be mapped, there's a need for that library to be built online. Um, if not, then we're just creating technology as the blind people outside in the dark. That's brilliant. That's wonderful. So we've got um, to look forward to more work on, on partnership and collaboration, new uh, new stakeholders, including the private sector. That's very exciting. And, and you know, using technology, using tech to uh, to share best practices uh, off a, off a, a well-vetted platform. That's brilliant um, and promising uh, way to end the uh, our session today. I want to thank both of you um, on behalf of all of our participants, uh, the Cities of Migration team here at the Global Diversity Exchange. I want to thank Alan Vernon from UNHCR and Josephine Goob from Tech Refugees for a brilliant exchange of ideas and conversations. To our audiences and Cities of Migration everywhere, I'd like you to imagine this excellent work being interpreted in your city, adapted uh, in your organization, and changed the, the neighborhoods you live in. We'd like to hear your stories and, and share more of these good practices, so please stay connected.